Hello, my name's John Aller, and I want to talk about writing an excellent one-minute essay. First, a little history. The one-minute essay has been used as a method of testing students on specific content presented in a class meeting, in which case the instructor puts one or several questions and students have a limited time to answer. About three questions is all you can handle. It's been used to evaluate a given class meeting or a portion of the meeting or the entire course. Here are a couple of examples. The Minute Paper. Are you interested in learning quick and effective ways to assess student learning? Are you interested in finding why students are having difficulty understanding and applying certain concepts they've just learned? The Minute Paper. This classroom assessment technique works well in a small discussion section, such as the Intro to Public Health course. This strategy also works well in large lectures. For example, Professor Joanna Milinchik uses this technique in her large materials science and engineering class. I often use this technique to assess students' understanding of course concepts by asking them to identify concepts that were least clear to them or ask a question like, what was the muddiest point in today's lecture? Here's another example. The one minute paper really usually has two components to it. You ask for the number one, you can put a number one at the top. And what I'd like for you to do is to please write down something meaningful that you remember from yesterday's class. Number two, I would like for you to please write down something where you might have still had a question. And number three, think back to, to a time that you took a test and try to think about where maybe you could have approached it a little bit differently and what strategy you would use and maybe teach to your students if you had the opportunity to do it again. The one minute writing assignment can also be used as a simple way to take role and stay in touch with students. It can serve as a kind of a running journal of what's going on in the classroom. So what should you write about or not? The best place to start is with something you think is vitally important that needs more discussion in the course. It might be the most confusing concept or the one where the most errors have been committed by people writing about a given research subject. It might be a question that's occurred to you that you would like to research and possibly answer, or one that you'd like the instructor to look into more closely. It might be an objection to something that was said in the assigned readings or in class. And we can talk about ways to phrase an objection in an unobjectionable way. It might be an experience that you've had that bears on what was discussed in the class meeting or in an assigned reading or in some other discussion to which you're responding. Anything that occurs to you that seems worth the printer's graphite may be useful to include in your one minute essay. Here's some examples of good comments and then we'll look at some that are not so good. Let's talk about the good ones first. Here's an example from a course on anatomy and physiology for students in training to become speech-language pathologists that occurred after a discussion and a video examining neurotoxins including mercury, aluminum, and lead. Here's a bit of the video that I showed during the class meeting. It is important to note that growth cones in all animal species, ranging from snails to humans, have identical structural and behavioral characteristics and use proteins of virtually identical composition. In this experiment, neurons also isolated from snail brain tissue were grown in culture for several days, after which very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibrils seen here. In contrast, other heavy metals added at this same concentration, such as aluminum, lead, cadmium, and manganese, did not produce this effect. One student wrote this, I know that some of my dental fillings are silvery gray in color and I think they probably contain mercury. Can that neurotoxin be what is causing my chronic migraines? To see just how prescient this comment is, let's go to the University of Louisiana website and log in to the U-Link, which will enable access to the Web of Science. I 
at the ULINK site. We scroll down to electronic databases, having logged in with a password. And now uh, we want to go to the W range in the index and then to Web of Science. And here I've inserted migraines and etiology and toxins in the search engine for the Web of Science. We click on the search and we find 15 current papers, fairly current, from 2012 back to uh, 1999 looking at various toxic effects on chronic migraines. My point is that undergraduate students in an introductory course can write excellent questions pertaining to complex subject matter such as neurotoxicity and its consequences. Here's another example from the same lecture discussion another student wrote when I encountered the term teratogens in my reading, it was a new word for me. In class, it was helpful to discover that certain toxins, such as mercury, Hg, can damage germ cells and cause birth defects or disorders passed down from generation to generation. It gives new meaning to the phrase genetic disorders. Among the known causes of genetic disorders that are handed down from generation to generation are genotoxins. Here's another example. In a class where disfluencies and their causes were, were discussed, a video of a person who stutters in speech was shown. Although Carly Simon is such a person, she can sing extremely rapid-fire lyrics in her hit song, Let the River Run, featured in the film Working Girl, starring Harrison Ford and Melanie Griffith. Here's the link, uh, the YouTube link, that you can go to to see Carly Simon performing the song better known as Let the River Run, though I think her title is Come the New Jerusalem. You see it here at 2 minutes and 37 seconds into the video. She launches into the chorus, which goes, We're coming to the edge, running on the water, coming through the park, your sons and daughters. Let the river run, let all the dreamers wake the nation, come the New Jerusalem. A student commented, for me, the most interesting thing in today's class meeting was the demonstration by Carly Simon that a person with chronic disfluency can be helped enough by the rhythms provided in a song so that her stuttering disappears. Also, it was useful to see that non-stutterers can be caused to stammer by delayed feedback in a laboratory setting. I think there's something about the way we notice rhythms that impacts how we attain normal fluency. Here's a video demonstrating how Persons who do not normally stutter can be caused to stutter by delayed auditory feedback. We're going to see how these clowns work with the headset now. Physiologists Berg Anderson showed that simulating certain regions of the hypothalamus triggered drinking behavior. Um, type 1 diabetes is a complex disorder whose onset is genetically susceptible individuals is sometimes preceded by a viral infection. Many type 1 diabetics develop their disease in childhood, giving rise to the old name of juvenile onset diabetes. About 10% of all <laughs> diabetics have type 1 diabetes. Because individuals with type 1 diabetes are <laughs> insulin deficient, the only treatment is insulin injections. So those are some examples of good one-minute essays. Here are some things, questions and comments, that thoughtful students will avoid like the plague. But these are black holes that unwary souls sometimes stumble and fall into. Students commonly write things like, Sorry I missed your class today. I hope I didn't miss anything important. If you miss one of my classes, you miss something important. One student wrote, I just couldn't handle one more thing, so I skipped the test in your class today because I was stressed over tests in two other classes. 
the student might as well have written your class isn't important, those other two are really important. Would it be possible to say that in a less objectionable way? How about saying, Dr. So-and-so, I was really stressed out and had a number of things that came down all at the same time and I just missed class. I'm so sorry. Period. Another student wrote, Today we talked about chapter 4 in the book. Now here's something that was probably written before the student started doing Facebook on her iPhone for the rest of the class meeting. She might as well have just written, in fact, I could have gotten this from the course syllabus without attending the class, but really I was sitting in class and this proves my participation. How could you do a better job with it? Say what was in chapter 4 or find something there worth commenting on, something worth objecting to, something important or something muddled, some error that you want to see corrected. Another student writes, what chapters will the test cover? You could say something like, I notice in the syllabus that you say tests will cover material in our readings. I expect that you're also going to cover material in the PowerPoints. Would you talk about that in our next class meeting, please? You never want to ask a question that concerns something that is written out explicitly in the syllabus. And if your only comment is to sign your name to a sheet of paper or to simply say that you were there on a certain date, it's hardly worth the candle. Instructors probably shouldn't give credit for class attendance for students who merely know that it was chapter 4 that was talked about on a certain date. You could find that out without even attending the class. It's all in the syllabus. Another student writes, I just don't understand why I don't get credit for class participation when my absence is excused. Finally, summing up, the one-minute writing exercise can be used as a basis for consolidating our learning, directing our teaching and research, for evaluating courses, students and teachers. It's a terrific educational tool. To write an excellent one-minute essay, we need to read the material assigned for class meetings before they occur, be alert, ready to rock and roll in each class meeting, and take the bull by the horns when it comes time to write. Get down to it and get it done. We need to focus on the facts at hand, look for the implications and applications in our own experience, trust our intuitions about what is important, mistaken, or worth more investigation, and then run with it courageously. I've always said there aren't any bad ideas, there are only undeveloped ideas. Good writing is based on good thinking, and excellent ideas are ones that have merely been developed a little more than the rest. I've often said there's any such thing as good writing. It's only good rewriting. And basically, an essay that's written in one minute is a kind of a draft to be thought about more and rewritten later on. My conclusion is that an excellent one-minute essay is one that involves some thinking, experience, and reading beforehand. I like C.S. Peirce's rule that writers need to love their readers for the reader's own sake. When you come right down to it, it's just a restatement of the golden rule as applied to good writing.